What top five you smoking on, Kendrick? Cause my top five is Drake, 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 Drake. Hey, Howard here. 1984 is a novel written by George Orwell. Despite its age, I recently picked it up and it was an incredibly enthralling and engaging experience. While I was reading it, I thought to myself, what kind of video game would 1984 be? An interactive world where you rebel against a restricted government? I, it could be super interesting. I know, that's like the most Gen Z thought ever. <sighs> reading is too boring. I want to play video games instead, they make me happy. The trash! It's the game! It sucks playing the shit! Anyway, I found my answer laying in the hands of Compulsion Games. So far, Compulsion Games has released two games, with a third one rumored to be in the works. Hey, Editing Howard here. This just goes to show how long ago I started writing this. The game got announced, it's called South of Midnight, and it looks super cool. Uh, okay, bye. The first game, released in November of 2013, is titled Contrast. The second, released in July of 2016, is the focus of this video. We happy few. Before I get into that game though, I do want to talk about Contrast. Spoilers, of course. Contrast is an extremely good concept. You play as Dawn, the imaginary friend of Dee Dee. Dee Dee is the daughter of Cat, an up-and-coming cabaret singer, and Johnny, a man who has dealings with bad people, jeopardizing the safety of him and his family. This, of course, led to the two splitting up. So it's Dee Dee's goal to reunite the two by helping Johnny make good on his debt. You may be wondering why I only show the silhouettes of Cat and Johnny, and this is because Contrast is set in a world where everyone is shadows. This plays into the main gimmick of the game, that being platforming that switches between 2D and 3D by switching between the shadow world and the real world. It was also good for development, since the devs didn't have to create detailed models for every background character or even larger characters like Cat and Johnny, especially since the Compulsion Games team consisted of only 7 people at the time. And as an example of how the team was able to get away with not having to render background characters, towards the beginning of the game in a nightclub or whatever, there's this crowd. It's presumed to be a full house, but because everybody is shadows, there doesn't need to be anybody visibly sitting in any chairs. Sure, you could say this is lazy, but it perfectly fits in because, I mean, you can't see shadows in a dark room. The gameplay is hard to wrap your head around in the beginning, because while with most platformers you only have to focus on jumping at the correct time and landing in the correct spot, contrast adds a third element, switching between the 2D and 3D worlds. It's definitely one of the most unique puzzle platformers I've played, but it's by no means the best. Remember when I said contrast is an extremely good concept? I said that because the game itself is incredibly mediocre at best. The story is very good, I like it a lot, but the gameplay, I mean, it's it's just okay. The controls felt clunky, moving around felt like a chore at times, and some of the shadow platforming was super glitchy. I also found myself not knowing where I needed to go to advance the story sometimes. It would say, go to this place in the top right, but I wouldn't know how to get there because it was a place I'd never been before. The game doesn't have any waypoint markers or anything, but the map was small enough that it didn't take more than 2 or 3 minutes to find where to go. The game also ended super abruptly. Cat and Johnny make up, and another character named Vincenzo makes it with Dee Dee over a previous conflict in the story. And then it just ends. I definitely feel like it could have been fleshed out more, but it is what it is. I did not enjoy playing Contrast. I was just waiting for it to be over during the last 5 minutes. But that is not to say that I didn't enjoy Contrast as a whole. The story was super solid. It was overflowing with good ideas and ambition, but it failed to reach the mark in terms of gameplay and polish. I took the time to talk about all that because it really sets the bar for their next game, We Happy Few. Using their experience gained from working on Contrast, they would strive to fix some of the major issues which held it back. Yet, despite their efforts, We Happy Few would suffer many of the same drawbacks that Contrast did. We Happy Few was a step in another direction for Compulsion Games. While Contrast had a focus on puzzles, We Happy Few would ditch that idea altogether. Guillaume Provost said in the We Happy Few documentary, The Cost of Joy, that I uh, really didn't want to make puzzles anymore. I mean, it's an interesting genre, but it was a genre that was very uh, taxing from a, on a design standpoint and a creative standpoint. The game was originally planned to have little to no story, but have a large amount of replayability. It was going to be a procedurally generated, roguelike experience, almost completely different to what it ended up becoming. This original concept was thought up while the team still consisted of about 5 or 6 people, so it made sense that they didn't want to have a super expansive world with a ton of story, it just would have been too much to handle. When they realized that the game most likely wouldn't be well received if that was how it launched, they started to put more emphasis on creating a memorable world with memorable characters. The game was first exposed to the public at PAX 2015. The game was shown in an incredibly unfinished state, it was just a randomly generated world without a story. 
It was a prototype, yet this was still enough to get people hyped. And it was this hype that pushed Compulsion Games to start a Kickstarter campaign. It didn't really do that well, you know, it was pretty typical. A quarter of a million in 25 days, it's trivial, really. Seriously though, it was said in the documentary that... Uh, also great, people love this stuff, so having a Kickstarter campaign um, was phenomenal in that way, and certainly the fact that it funded development for as long as it did, thank God, otherwise there would be no We Happy Few, or we would have stopped when it was just a survival horror simulation. The hype got so large to the point that Microsoft started getting involved, inviting them on the E3 2016 stage. This boosted the amount of people who knew about We Happy Few's existence from a couple thousand to millions. And from there, it continued snowballing. I won't detail every step of the way, you can just watch the documentary linked below. But after E3, more people knew about the game and the team. That meant more money flowing in through the Kickstarter and more people who wanted to work on the game. Now with all of this excitement, money, and the general idea of what they wanted the game to be, they got it done, slapped a $50 price tag on it, and watched the reviews roll in. They were incredibly mixed. The game starts out with a man at his job accepting or censoring newspapers. One paper, which is written about himself and his brother, catches his eye, causing all of the world's vibrancy to disappear. He dumps out some pills and ponders. I should just take my joy, shouldn't I? He tosses the pills aside, and time starts slipping away until his boss comes in where she interrogates him. What have you been up to? No one's seen you for hours. Oh, nose to the grindstone, you know. Then why haven't I heard a single whoosh through the door since ten o'clock? Did you forget we're having Deirdre's birthday party? Oh. We've got a piñata. Right. Brilliant. Of course. Have you forgotten your joy? <laughs> no. The newspaper distressed the man, which is why the world lost its vibrancy. It also caused screams to fill the room. Percy! Percy! We're not sure why yet, but it'll be revealed in time. He has to go to a birthday party held in the other room, where a pinata sits on the table and the man's peer, Zagamanda, whack it. Come on, hit it! Hit it! Hit it! We don't have all day! The man is disgusted, but nobody else seems to mind. His boss notices his reaction and says, you are off your joy. Take one of mine. Oh my lord. He's a downer. Call security. We've got a downer. The man gets chased out of the building by policemen. Hey, you on a pizza here. Oh. Until he reaches a dead end. This intro is phenomenal. It sets the tone for the game perfectly and brings up some things that'll be answered later. Why did the paper trigger the man so badly? Why are there screams? Who is this guy? I did take him. No, no, leave me alone. I took my joy. I took my joy. No, no, leave me alone. No. <sighs> Who is this guy? These are all questions that the devs tailored the intro to provoke you to ask. It draws you in without you even having to do anything yet. The main question they want you to start thinking about though, is what is joy? We know by the boss's intense reaction to the man not taking the joy that it's an integral asset to the lives of the people of this world, but that's about it. The intro gives you the decision to either take the pill or to remember. Remembering is how you continue the game, but taking the pill, all of the colors brought back to the world after the man remarks. Right. Happiness is a choice. This gives more clarity as to what joy is. It's a drug that makes the user happy. Ah. Okay, okay, wait. Put a pin in that for now. What is We Happy Few exactly? We Happy Few is an open world, procedurally generated, immersive sim. What? Alright, let me break that down. Instead of a linear experience, where a game's only path is moving in a line from A to B like this, an open world is more like this. So you can go here, or here, or here. It places more emphasis on exploration. Procedurally generated just means that the world changes every time you start a new game. So your first playthrough's map could look like this, while the second looks like this. Simple. And immersive sim just means that your decisions directly affect the way you interact with the world and the way the world interacts with you. But I hope that someday, maybe, a big gust of wind will come and push me off, 
so I can end it all. What? The world feels like it can exist without your presence. Smash all that together Frankenstein style and you get We Happy Few. So alright, now that that's out of the way, let's get into the first part of We Happy Few, the general story. Super big spoilers for this entire game, by the way, so. We Happy Few is set in a post-World War II world in which the Germans were victorious. This timeline is nothing new, the entire Wolfenstein series is like that, but there's a stark contrast between the world of Wolfenstein and We Happy Few. No, no, mein Führer, I'm, I'm from Arizona. In Wolfenstein, it's clear as day that the Germans rule the world. You can't go one second without seeing a or other assorted the imagery. In We Happy Few, however, if you took a random snippet of gameplay and showed it to someone who knew nothing about the game, one of their last thoughts would be, yeah, the is on the world. And that's due to how the people in the worlds of Wolfenstein and We Happy Few reacted to the German takeover. And obviously mainly because they're completely different genres. Wolfenstein takes place in a much different world to our own, where the Germans were extremely powerful people equipped with ancient, mystical Jewish technology, which allowed them to stomp out any opposition. This obviously led all other global superpowers to cede themselves to Germany, and they got to rule the world. Hence, all the flags and other symbols spread throughout each and every scene in this game. We Happy Few is more grounded in reality. The Germans are pretty much the same as they were in the real world, the only difference being that the allied powers find themselves on the losing side of the war. Are you going to hurt us? No one's going to hurt you, Percy. I, I promise. But, but have they hurt the city? I don't think they'll blow anything else up. Why? Because we surrendered, I hope. The British island of Wellington Wells, We Happy Few settings, has no flags or anything like Wolfenstein because they sent all of their children away on a train to Germany to avoid occupation in 1946. This made all of the inhabitants of the island incredibly miserable, so the company Hayworth Labs attempted to make a solution, ultimately coming up with a drug called Joy in the 1950s. Joy fills the user with euphoria, letting them see the world as a shinier, happier version of itself. This is seen in the intro where the piñata was actually just a rat. One of the many side effects of Joy is memory suppression. Obviously, taking a drug that makes you happy is great, but if you still remember what you did to the children, it didn't negate the happy feelings. Joy is also a contraceptive. You're here for Rue, I imagine. Rue? Why the hell would I need Rue? She's not- That's an abortifacient. Oh. I'm not pregnant. I, I can't be, Joy's a contraceptive. The regular kind is. After they gave away the children, but before Joy's invention, some children were born, but they made everyone so unhappy that they just ended up sending them away anyway. Hey fuck, now it's actually hanging. The people of Wellington Wells were hesitant to take their joy in the beginning. I mean, wouldn't you be? This drug that's supposed to make you forget the bad. It sounds good on paper, but if you saw this in a pharmacy, you'd probably be a bit wary, especially if it just came out. It was the idea of one of the higher-ups, Victoria Bing, the boss from the intro, to put joy in the water supply. Oh, there was another riot this morning. A couple wouldn't stop talking about how they missed their little darlings. And why haven't the Russians sent them back? <laughs> they should take their joy. Nobody likes a downer. <laughs> you can't just wrap a pill in bacon and expect they'll swallow it. They're not dogs. Put it in their tea, then. What do you mean? Dose the sugar cubes? Dose the water supply. Everyone drinks tea. You don't even have to tell them at first. That led to everyone in Wellington Wells picking up joy even if they had no desire to, so that they'd start taking the pills. However, some people still refused to take their joy. This led to a massive disconnect between the people of Wellington Wells. The people who refused their joy were labeled downers. Being around a downer if you're on joy leads you to feeling sad, completely defeating the point of joy. So all the joy-taking people of Wellington Wells unanimously decided to forcibly move all of the downers to a rundown part of the island, the Garden District. This exile is horrible because it practically rips you away from all of your friends, your family, Basically everything you've ever known, all because of some little pill. What's worse is that it may not even be your fault if you get exiled. Bad batches of joy have been going out to the public, leaving some people to get kicked off their joy to no fault of their own. Yeah, it's like the latest groovy nightclub, isn't it? People get a bad batch of joy, and it like flips a switch, and they can't take joy anymore. So they get chased out of the village. Been a lot of bad batches lately. Continuing with joy, I said that it caused memory suppression. I chose my words carefully because it doesn't make you forget forever. You haven't taken your own joy, have you? Joy doesn't help. 
You never really forget, do you? It just makes things fuzzy around the edges, you know? So you can pretend. Joy puts the user in a brain fog. It helps you pretend that everything is sunshine and rainbows, but the terrible past can never leave you. After a while, that brain fog started causing serious problems for the stability of the island. Wellington Wells is at a severe food shortage. Trade from the British mainland is closed down, probably because of the fact that they don't have Joy over there. Hey, look at me, I'm British! Wow, epic fail! <sighs> They can't even farm because they don't even know that they're starving. The brain fog caused by joy clouds what should be obvious. It's also causing maintenance workers to not do their job. In the maintenance tunnels, you can find a board of municipal utilities where it shows that most of Wellington Wells is in the danger zone. This causes toxic fog to spill out into the streets at night. The island is on its knees, but nobody can do anything about it because of joy. The head of Hayworth Labs, Anton Verloc, knows that there's serious danger afoot. He's one of the very few people off of their joy legally. The citizens of the island cling to their joy like their lives depend on it, but they aren't stupid. They know if they want more joy, the people in charge have to be able to have a clear enough head to keep production flowing. Verloc knows about the food shortage in the fog, so he comes up with something he labels as a permanent solution. If this sounds familiar to you, it's probably because the name harkens back to Nazi Germany's final solution, which referred to the back in World War II. In essence, Verloc's permanent solution is the same thing, albeit on a much, MUCH smaller and less severe scale. The permanent solution proposed by Verloc would render Joy as Wellington Wells knew it completely obsolete. Upon using it, the patient would be rendered happy forever, no longer capable of feeling any other emotion. In a parallel with Germany's final solution, Verloc's permanent solution aims to annihilate all sadness in the world. It would have the same effect as Joy, but it would remove the brain fog. His cause is noble, but much like how Germany saw nothing wrong with murdering millions of people, Verloc sees nothing wrong with removing what makes people human, their emotion. You're planning to lobotomize the people of Wellington Wells, aren't you? Lobotomize is a rather inflammatory metaphor, but yes, I have been asked to synthesize something stronger and more permanent than joy. Who are you? If you force people to have the emotions you want, then you've turned them into robots made out of meat! <laughs> And what do you think you are now? You are just the sum of the neuropeptides swirling in your bloodstream. You see, the current downer outbreak is just a mass chemical imbalance. But I believe I can adjust the internal hormonal settings so the people stay happy no matter what. You can't do that. They told the Wright brothers they couldn't fly, but they did. Sure, right now everybody's already doing that willingly, but they can stop whenever they like. If Verloc's permanent solution was to come out, they'd be incapable of stopping their happiness and facing reality. Verloc's permanent solution hasn't come out by the time the game takes place, but it's in active development throughout. And on top of all that doom and gloom, there's a plague ravaging the island. Watch out for anyone chattering away in something that don't sound like English. They're like mad dogs, and they'll give you plague. We Happy Fuse World is great. Wellington Wells is split apart into three sections, the Garden District, Hamlin Village, and the Parade District. They're all incredibly unique and different from one another. They follow a pretty obvious hierarchy, with the Garden District being the lowest where all the downers live, the Village being in the middle where all the decent, joy-taking citizens live, and the Parade being at the top where all the higher ranking people live. There's a mutual hatred between the Garden District and the other two, since the joy-taking people chase the downers away from everything they knew, and the downers threaten the new way of life for the joy-taking people. I'm going to talk about each section, starting off with the Garden District. It's just amazing. It's definitely a sharp contrast compared to the other two districts. The Garden District is miserable, and that's what makes it amazing. You can practically feel the weight of the past hanging over this place. You can catch people rummaging through garbage looking for anything to do, or just crying on a bench. The memories haunt these people. They could have taken them, but they didn't have to, did they? I just want them to stop screaming. That's all. Where are the Americans? Where are the Russians? I wish I'd died in the bombings. Nearly every house is run down or reduced to rubble. Every person you see here has tattered clothes, which really emphasizes how hard it is to live here without you really having to see much of the place. There's no police force here, just a large gang called the Head Boys who intimidate and steal what little remains for these people. It's a really cool introduction to the game as well, since it's the first place you're able to roam around in after the intro. There's a little sub-area in the Garden District called the Victory Memorial Camp, where war veterans hang out and stay alert in case the Germans ever come back. They're armed with rifles, but have no ammunition, so they have to use bayonets. 
This makes it laughable that they expect to have any sort of a chance if a full military armed with heavy weaponry were to come back. However, they're very dangerous in game, as all of this game's combat is melee. This area is teeming with life. 90% of this area is grass and shrubbery, and there's a fair amount of things to collect here. Flowers can be collected to make healing salves, while berries can be used as a source of food. There are also some water pumps here. The water in the garden district is clean, unlike in the other two areas where it's spiked with joy. This makes the Garden District an excellent place to get food and water without worrying about the negative side effects. One of the most interesting things about this place is things you can find in houses. In certain housings, you can find messages scrawled onto walls. I wonder if they meant the kids on the train. Like they couldn't remember their faces. Or well, they couldn't stand remembering them. Miscellaneous items. What's on those beds? Oh god. I'm not the only one remembering the children, am I? Makes sense. They're all off their joy out here. And other tragedies. It really makes this area feel real. People lived here. People remembered here. People crumbled under the weight of their past here. The second area in the social hierarchy of Wellington Wells is Hamlin Village. This area takes the depressing vibe of the Garden District and flips it on its head. One of the most eye-catching differences between the two is the color. The Garden District was very dull looking. All the colors lacked any sort of vibrancy, with grays, browns, and dark greens, perfectly fitting the downtrodden feel of the area. Hamlin Village is the complete opposite. Streets painted rainbow, the booths that dispense joy, various gardens and parks, it's beautiful, and it's only heightened when you use joy, which makes everything a bit more bright and vibrant. The colors are obviously put there to distract people from their dreary past. The streets may be painted rainbow, but the past still left its scars in the form of rubble left over from the war. The people here are also more lively, as you might expect due to their joy intake. You can catch them jumping in puddles, playing hopscotch, or cuddling on a bench. It's little things like this that make these random NPCs feel like more than objects placed there to fill space. One of the most obvious aspects of their design though is their mask. It was definitely something I immediately took note of, hell it's even a major part of the logo. These masks, from a gameplay standpoint, make these characters unnerving, probably for the same reason people find clowns scary. It obscures the face just enough for you to recognize it as human, but makes it odd enough to be concerning. From a lore standpoint though, the masks form to your face and force you to smile. Why are you all wearing those ridiculous new masks? You should get one. They shape your face into a smile, and when you smile, you can't help being happy. Just another way to cling to their rickety happiness. Also, their clothes are nicer, obviously because they live a much cushier life than the downers in the Garden District. The village, unlike the Garden District, has an established police force, the Constabulary, differentiated from the normal citizens by their hugeness and blue uniform. Constables are tougher enemies than normal citizens, having more health and hitting harder. From 9 o'clock p.m. to 7 o'clock a.m., there's a curfew in the village and the parade. Constables roam the streets, and if you're spotted, you'll be chased relentlessly until either they kill you, you kill them, or you hide, and they eventually give up their search. Given the toxic fog that spills out into the streets at night anyway, it's best to find a bed and sleep until morning. And where else better to sleep than in a house you just broke into? The houses in the village are packed full of stuff to steal. You can raid their kitchen for food, look through cupboards, wardrobes, and credenzas for supplies, or clear out a bedroom to get some shut-eye. You don't have to loot houses if you don't want to, but it is a good way to get stuff that could be hard to come by otherwise. The village also has a lot of dedicated shops. Some examples are Cuddy's Shop, where you can buy meat, The Shady Dealer, where you can buy illegal stuff like safe crackers, explosives, and sugar, and A Stitch in Time, where you can buy clothes. For comparison, the only shop in the Garden District is via a crazy man in a tree house selling screws and bandages. Welcome to the Special Operations Executive. You're the new agent, aren't you? I'm not upset with y'all because I know you're mentally ill. The shops are nice to visit every once in a while as they restock sometimes and they may have something helpful for you. Much like the Victory Memorial Camp in the Garden District, Hayworth Lads is a sub area in the village. This is where all the island's joy is produced and where Verloc throughout the game works on his permanent solution. The third and final area is the Parade District. This area is functionally similar to the village, but packed with many more things. For starters, the constables here are stronger variants of their village counterparts, as shown by their red uniform. Doctors now roam the streets frequently. The doctors are a unique enemy, as they can smell the joy in your body. If they see, or well, I guess smell, that you haven't taken your joy, they'll aggro on you. They can also revive enemies that you killed, so it's important to focus these guys first. The Parade District is the smallest of the districts, yet has much more substance. The three main points of interest in this area are the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, or DSIR for short, the Wellington Health Institute, and the Broadcast Tower. The DSIR is where they, well, do scientific and industrial research. The Wellington Health Institute is where doctors run tests on plague victims, and the Broadcast Tower is where they screen Uncle Jack shows. 
You don't know who that is yet, but I'll fill you in later. Each of the districts are connected via bridges, with some providing you unique challenges, like Plassey Bridge which makes you play a long, drawn out Simon Says mini game that sprays joy gas in your face, or one bridge connecting the Garden District to Hamlin Village where a doctor inspects you for plague before letting you pass. The districts are also connected via old rail tunnels. No trains run on them anymore, obviously because trains would bring back the painful memories of sending the kids away. The rail tunnels are accessed via hatches, and they act as a fast travel system. We Happy Few's main premise is conformity. Act how you should, depending on the people and environment around you, and you'll be fine. Clothes are one of the main aspects of this. Wearing good clothes in the Garden District reminds all the downers of the joy takers who chase them out of their homes, and wearing torn clothes in the village will lead people to thinking you're one of those rotten downers. The way you speak changes throughout the different areas too, with the protagonist speaking sorrowfully in the Garden District. Alright. Well, nothing lasts forever, does it? At least we're alive. Right. Chipper in the village. Nothing but blue skies. Should clear up soon, I imagine. Couldn't be better, thanks. And even more so in the parade. I mentioned that all of the game's weapons are melee based. This is because there's no need for guns in a land where everyone is happy. Most of the weapons you use are normal objects like frying pans and umbrellas, but actual weapons can be found hidden behind puzzles and stuff like that. There's also a really cool feature that anytime you die, instead of having a plain old you died screen. <laughs> a newspaper gets released saying that you went on holiday to explain your disappearance to anyone who may remember you. If you jumped off the island into the water, you overexerted yourself swimming. If you died from fall damage, you're on holiday to recuperate from an amateur skydiving incident. And if you die from food poisoning, you're out to explore new and exciting cuisines. It's nice attention to detail because it plays into the theme of troubling things being sanitized. They could have easily just added a you died screen, but they went the extra mile to add more of that immersion. Also the music in this game is phenomenal. Each district has its own track, with the garden district being a peaceful but somewhat sad piano track, something almost like Minecraft. Hamlin Village has a more upbeat track, even more so like Minecraft. and the parade district sounding more unnerving as this is the point in the game where you know all of the terrible stuff that's going on behind the scenes. But if you know anything about this game, the ambient tracks aren't the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the music. The devs created a band specifically for this game called The Make Believes. It was comprised of actual musicians from Canada. Together they made 10 to 12 tracks for the game, but only 7 can be heard in game, with an 8th being used for the launch trailer. The songs are Dead of Winter, if my You'll never change my mind. La la la. There is no way of what us but for the sun. Not a crime to smile. When You're Gone, which is the credits track. Joy Time. Cheer Up. And I Want to Stay the Same, which is the launch trailer check.
These songs are super cool. They got a really cool vibe to them. You can listen to the full songs on YouTube or Spotify or whatever. These songs can be heard in shops and homes as background audio, but they can also play during some gameplay scenes. There's one character that's omnipresent in this game, and it's Uncle Jack. He's a television and radio star, the only one in the whole island. He has many different shows, such as I Hear You, where citizens will send him letters. Dear Uncle Jack, is it true there are blind albino mole people living beneath our fair city? That's what my friends say. I thought I saw one too, but I wasn't sure, as we'd all had a bit too much to drink. And my memory, of course, is a bit fuzzy. Hmm. <laughs> Dear Richard, of course there aren't mole people. This isn't London. Humor hour, where citizens send them jokes. <laughs> and here's another one. Um, how do you save a drowning downer? Answer, who cares? <laughs> and news hour, where Jack gives some tips about living with other decent citizens. Well, look at you. What are you doing? Yes, that's right. I'm talking to you. What on earth do you think you're doing? Are you where you should be? Are you doing what you should be doing? Of course you are. Let's face it, there's nowhere we'd rather be and nothing we'd rather be doing than living our lives here and now in Wellington Wells, eh? Jack's shows are genuinely enjoyable to watch. They feel like real episodes of a real TV show. I think the Uncle Jack shows really make the world feel real because these shows always run at the same time every day. At 7 a.m. it plays Wakey Wakey, noon plays News Hour, 4 p.m. plays either I Hear You, Humor Hour, Play With Jack, or Funny Old Customs. At 7.30 p.m. it plays Well Well Well, That Tastes Amazing, or Famous Britons. And at 10.30 p.m. it plays Nighty Night. Every day. It doesn't matter if you're there watching on the TV, it will still play. It makes the world feel like it could exist even if you weren't in it. At 7am, Wakey Wakey will play whether the players in Wellington Wells are all the way off in Timbuktu. Needless to say, the way We Happy Few designed its areas, each very unique with their own way of going about things, really makes the world memorable. But my favorite aspect by far is... Like any game, the characters are what ties the game together. Without characters that are unique and memorable, your game won't have any longevity. Take Team Fortress 2 for example. This game is absolutely notorious for a variety of things, like its racist community, its homophobic community, its misogynistic community. <laughs> no, I love this game, but the community sucks really bad. Oh, what, you're live on Twitch? Anyway, Team Fortress 2 is absolutely notorious for its cast of characters. TF2 is comprised of nine big hot men... I wrote that in the script? Okay, whatever. TF2 is comprised of nine big hot men, each overflowing with personality. The game itself is amazing, the art style is fantastic, and the gameplay is fun and fluid. On its own, it's fun, but with the cast that Valve put together, the game went from just being a fun but ultimately forgettable game to almost a household name. Seriously, literally every person who identifies as a gamer has at least heard of this game or watched the Meet the Team videos. What I'm trying to get across is that a game can be good, but without good characters to tie it all together, the experience can be very forgettable. This is something We Happy Few knocks out of the park. The world is great, as I said. The story is great, as I said. And the characters just bring it home. The game follows three characters over three separate acts. Act 1 follows Arthur Hastings, a man who is pretty average in all regards, living in the parade district before going off his joy as seen in the intro. Act 2 follows Sally Boyle, a chemist living in Hamlin Village who supplies the constabulary with a special type of joy and who also has a baby. You want me? Yes. What are you? Whoa! <laughs> Act 3 follows Ollie Starkey, an alcoholic Scottish man that nobody likes. Because of course, who hallucinates his dead daughter who was shot and killed by the Germans in the war. Okay, I'm gonna go over each act now. I'll try to make this as brief as possible, as my first few scripts for this video ended up at around 40 pages. Act 1 starts with the intro that I went over earlier. Arthur wakes up after being beaten unconscious by the constables. Seeing that newspaper about him and his brother, Percy, is shaking him up. Percy was put on the train to Germany, and now Arthur makes a plan to get out of Wellington Wells and find him. The only way out of Wellington Wells is via the old rail tunnels in the train station in the Garden District. The bridge. I've got to get to the bridge. In the Parade District, which I just got chased out of. Brilliant. Ah, the train station. If I can get to the train station, I can just follow the old rail tunnel all the way to the bridge. 
Upon reaching the train station, he falls to the floor and starts remembering more about the train, where we learn that Arthur couldn't go because he was just one day too old, with the rule being no kid over 13. Bloody Bobby. I told him I wanted to board even if I was 10 days too old, but we don't make the rules anymore, Mr. Hastings. I shouldn't have told him they got my birthday wrong. I don't even know why I did. There's a cave-in on the rails, meaning that there's no way to get to the bridge out of Wellington Wells now. With nowhere else to go, Arthur goes back up into the train station where Ollie has been living. Bloody hell. That's Ollie! Ollie! Come from me, have you? Ollie! I'm Arthur! You won't get me! You won't get me, you bastard! Ollie! No! It's Arthur! Bloody murdering wastrels! You go mental! I'll save you, Margaret! I'm your old neighbour, Artie! Always lying! Little Artie! Artie's gone! They took him away! Ollie, no! They You're didn't! You're lying! You're a waste Ollie, it's Arthur! Well, why didn't you see that before? Mentally ill. Arthur brings up his plans to find Percy, and Ollie offers to help him escape Wellington Wells if he helps him rob the Victory Memorial Camp. He sneaks into the camp where we learn that the tanks that the Germans used to intimidate everyone into giving up the kids were fake all along. We took all the kids to the train station. We sent them off to Germany because of Papier Mache. Arthur cuts the power and returns to the train station. The tanks were hollow, Ollie. What's that? It's tank armor. The tanks, they're made of papier-mâché. We could have fought them if they didn't really have tanks. No. I wouldn't have given them Percy and we the others. Up. I wouldn't have had to lie my way off that train. Oh, my God. I lied my way off that train. I wasn't too old to go. You don't forget a thing like that. Didn't you hear me? I convinced the Germans they had my birthday wrong. Arthur was perfectly able to go, but lied to the constables to avoid going with his brother to Germany. A super selfish act, and that's exactly his character. We Happy Few touts itself as the tale of a plucky bunch of moderately terrible people trying to escape from a lifetime of cheerful denial. And that couldn't be more true. Every character in this game is terrible to a degree, some more than others, but I'll get into that later. Arthur essentially stranded his brother in Germany. Percy is revealed to be mentally challenged in some regard via the collectible memories scattered throughout the game. Oh, Percy, that's very bad. No, Arthur, it's brilliant. Why is it brilliant? She won't make me be in trouble, because I'm slow. Arthur is the only person who Percy could talk to, and Arthur left him to go to a new world where he would be completely and utterly alone. Ollie holds up his end of the bargain and gives Arthur a device which he uses to get back into the village. To get to the parade where the bridge out of Wellington Wells is, he'd need a letter of transit which he no longer has. On his way to find some blank ones, he comes across Sally Boyle, his girlfriend from his childhood. You're off your joy. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, you have little fucking faith. I'm not gonna turn you in. Whatever possess you to go off your joy? <sighs> Percy. Oh. I saw a picture of him. She offers to get him the letter of transit he needs, saying she knows General Bing, one of the higher ranking people of the island. Problem is, Arthur holds some pretty strong grudges, berating her for cheating on him 14 years ago. I'm very close with General Bing. Of course you are. <laughs> no. You always did have a knack for making helpful new friends. I mean, I could go see him and ask him to give you a letter of transit. Don't put the general out on my account. I'm sure you've only so many favors you can ask of him. My god, you still hate me, don't you? Yeah, well, I've only been wondering for the past 14 years. We were 16! How could you? You're a whore. You're a whore, just admit it. You're a whore, you whore yourself out online, you whore yourself out in front of your family and your friends. You're a whore, plain and simple. By the time he realizes that Sally is probably the only person who can help him, it's too late. She's already gone. He goes to her house to apologize, and she agrees to get him the letter of transit, now wanting Arthur to get her cod liver oil in return. This sets him off a bit. About the letter. Could you... do something for me? Uh, of course. What? I need a bottle of cod liver oil. I'd really like one. Cod liver oil? Why on earth would you want cod liver oil? If it's too much to ask. 
Well, I was kind of hoping for... Absolutely, I will ask my friend the General for a rotten scrap of paper just for old time's sake. Oh, I'm being an ass again, aren't I? At least he recognized he was being an ass this time character development. It just shows more of his character, completely selfish. Sally could have easily said no and he would have been completely f but she was nice and agreed, and he couldn't reciprocate that kindness. About the letter? No. Oh. The Cod Liver Oil is in Dr. Verloc's office in Hayworth Labs. Retrieving it and getting back to Sally, Arthur loses his mind again, ironically describing himself more than her. We're practically the only two people in this entire city not stoned out of our minds on joy. How are you holding up? What do you care? How are you going to get out? Why won't you just give me the fucking letter of transit? Oh, it's always what you want. Always what you need. Every little Sally whim. Bloody cod liver oil. Arthur wanted the letter of transit, but was really hesitant to do anything for Sally in return, complaining at the very thought that he should be made to do anything. She's been nothing but kind since meeting up with him, but she has absolutely no reason to be. Every time she's with him, she gets berated. I can't say Arthur's hate is unfounded, though, as Sally cheated on him with his own father. Do you really th think I'm that awful? Well, just because you fucked my dad while you were living in our house, in my mom's bed? Yes. There's a lot to unpack with that statement, but just hold on, I'll get to it a bit later. Arthur offers to take Sally with him, but she says she has to wait until dawn and he just completely revokes his offer. I'm sorry. Look, I don't hate you. In the strangest way, you're completely innocent. You're practically the only one I know who is. It's on the dresser there. Are you going to be okay? I could take you with me. Really? We have to go now. The joy's gone bad. It's going crazy out there. I can't go right now. Why? Oh, God. No. It's not simple. It never is. We'll have to wait till dawn. No, that, that, that's crazy. I, I can't. Oh, you shouldn't have asked for that ridiculous cod liver oil. Look, there's something I haven't been entirely straight with you about. Mm. <sighs> It's just self-preservation, Sally. No hard feelings. Just showing more of his hypocrisy, claiming Sally is incredibly selfish, yet he himself being incredibly uncompromising in the smallest of inconvenience. He does show some semblance of guilt for leaving her behind, though, in a note titled, I'm an awful person, but... What should I have done? Should I have turned around and said, yes, I will, yes, come with me, we'll go at dawn, whatever you say. I always used to wonder if I'd run out that door after that day. What would have happened to us? Would we still be friends, or was the magic all in my head? Who am I kidding? 16-year-old me would never have had the courage to leave home. And here I am, running out the door when she wants to come with. Not entirely unlike what I did to Percy. I wonder what lies I'll tell myself about her later. What if she is? utterly sincere. What if she does honestly want me, and love me, and need me? Do I have utterly no faith left in anyone? And she'd survive and I'd get killed. A girl like her shipwrecks and the next day she's drinking margaritas under palm leaves. Yours truly is shark bait. I can't. I just can't. Sorry. 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 I feel like he does want to trust Sally, but can't because of how she cheated on him. In the end, all of his bitterness and spite towards her stems from that incident, so he feels it's best not to get too attached to her. Arthur gets into the parade and eventually onto the bridge out of Wellington Wells, where he reflects. Are you really doing this to find Percy? I mean, where would you even look for him? Is he even alive? Is he in Russia? How would you even get to Germany? You're doing this because you don't have a strong enough sense of self-preservation to leave Wellington Wells on your own account, aren't you? You need the guilt. Arthur's entire reasoning for leaving was to find his brother and make amends, but there's really no way that this would ever happen. It's been nearly 20 years since Percy was taken away with the other kids. In that time, he could have moved anywhere in the world, but his fate was likely darker. If the Germans were anything like they were in the real world, he was most likely killed soon after arriving, as his mental handicap would have hindered his ability to work. Arthur goes through the door, the final obstacle in the way of freedom, and finds a constable. It's the same constable from the day the children were taken, and upon taking off his mask, Arthur remembers the entire situation. Damn thing so itchy. It's times like these what 
try men's souls, sir. They try men's souls. I... Who are you? Please keep your hands inside the train. It is very dangerous to... You must get back on the train. The windows of the train. Where'd you go? Arthur! You must get back on board. No, I'm just here to take my brothers to the train. Mr. No, Percival Hastings. No. That's me, Arthur, Percy. No, People no, call me Percy. Please, no. Someone has written on this card that you are a bit dim and you can't be roaming about on your own. You don't seem dim. Right, well, um, Mum thinks I can't... Mum no. thinks I can't... No, no, Mum no. thinks I can't no, no. take no, no. care of myself. Arthur. But I can. To tell the truth, I really did want to go to Germany with my brother, Arthur. See, we, we'd sort of take care of each other. So I tried to sneak on, but then Arthur said, no, we have to follow the rules. Is that so? I'll just run along home. Mum's probably worried sick. Can I go? This is a day we may all come to regret, Mr. Hastings. But I am not going to put one more child on that train than my duty obligates me to do. Run along, then. He not only lied to get off the train, he stole his brother's passport knowing that if he gave the constable his own card, he'd be put right back on the train. He even mimics his brother's mannerisms as seen throughout the game's collectible memories. Why do you want to speak Latin? You always... You always... You always know. You always know. You always know. You always know. You always know what each... You always know what each word means when it comes out. Right, well, um, Mum thinks I can't... Mum thinks I can't... Mum thinks I can't take care of myself. We're between 700 billion and a trillion 300 million billion dollars. The last thing Percy saw of his brother was him abandoning him. Worse yet, it wasn't even Percy's idea to go with Arthur on the train. I've got it. What if you come with me? And I'm too old. What if I sneak you on the train? That's against... That's against the rules. Well, if we get caught, I'll just say there was a mix-up and you can play dumb. Are you sure? Remember how I snuck you on the camping trip? Didn't it work out brilliantly? Just trust me. I trust you, Arthur. I said I trust you, Arthur. We'll go to Germany together. We'll take care of each other, no matter what happens. Arthur probably knew from the start that he was going to abandon Percy. Now with the memories fresh in his mind, he's left to pick up the pieces. I'll best be on my way. something terrible. Oh, we have all done things we regret, sir. Some of them we regretted as we done them. Some of them never quite go away. I told them we'd go to Germany together. I told them I'd hold our passports and then I walked off the train with his passport. He didn't know how to talk to anyone but me. I can't make it up to him now. Can I? No, sir. I imagine you cannot. Then who is there to forgive me? Some try to forget. I can't do that. Not anymore. Well, I suppose you, you must treat it as a gift. To know who you are. Without that, there's no hope for wisdom. I wish I still believed in some sort of mercy. Life goes on. That is the mercy. Come on, sir. Once you're out there, you'll know what to do. The game switches to third person, where Arthur takes off his happy mask and takes one last look at Wellington Wells, his home, and essentially his prison, and walks off with the constable to the mainland.
I love this ending. The voice acting in this game is incredible, and in this scene, Alex Wyndham, Arthur's actor, knocks it out of the park, sounding truly distraught over what he did to his brother. Unlike most games where the protagonist gets his good ending, Arthur's ending is very grey. He doesn't get a good ending because he doesn't deserve it. He does get to leave Wellington Wells, which is good, but he can never escape his memories now. He will always be stuck with the truth that he's a rotten, selfish, entitled, sh human being with no joy to hide behind. Act 2 follows Sally and starts with her doing sciencey stuff in her lab. Someone breaks in looking for something called Blackberry and finds Sally's baby. She broke my brain. It's not possible. We sent them all away. They never came back. It's a, it's a rat. Isn't it? I'm hallucinating and it's a rat and it's gonna bite me. You can't be a baby. You're a rat. You have to be a rat. The blackberry he's looking for is a special type of joy produced for the constables, but Sally sells some illegally on the side. She goes to a shopkeeper called Lionel to commission an automatic baby feeder and a carry cot for if she and her baby ever needed to move around, which he builds over the course of the story. The constables are growing concerned with how slow the blackberry is being churned out, so they interrogate and threaten her. Nonetheless, Miss Boyle, the lads have developed an appetite for your fine cooking, as it were. If they go hungry, chaos will ensue. We must insist that you devote your full and urgent attention to feeding them. Or what? Or we shall be compelled, willing or no, to provide your assistance, willing or no, to Dr. Verloc. And that won't be cheery for either of us. We don't know Sally's relationship with Dr. Verloc, but with how she spoke of him in Act One... Cod liver oil. Dr. Verloc has some at the labs on us class. He keeps a whole private stash of rare ingredients. I'm sort of persona non grata there. And how the constables are threatening her now, it's fair to say it's not good. A fire broke out in her lab while she was gone, destroying a piece of the equipment. On her way to get the replacement, she remembers something troubling. Well, young Miss Boyle. You know there's a curfew. You don't want some Fritz to shoot you dead, do you? Sorry, sir. Let's get you home. You had another fight with your mum, didn't you? Why don't I put in a good word? Miss, uh, Mrs. Boyle, I've got a young lady out here who, um... I'm sorry. They don't seem to be at home. What? Let me go in. They're not at home. Let me take you to the station for a cup of tea. What happened? Let me in. Best you don't go in, miss. Cup of tea's best. What did she do? What did she do? What, what did she do? Her mother poisoned her whole family to avoid the children from getting on the train to Germany. The only reason that Sally isn't dead along with the rest of her family is because she was a troublemaker who went out after curfew. She finds a replacement part and fixes her lab. Now she needs to replace her chemicals. In the midst of doing that, she hears someone in her house. It's General Bing, who visits Sally for sex and drugs. He hears her baby, but Sally tries to convince him that he was just hallucinating. What on earth is that? Are you hallucinating? Rainbow has all sorts of crazy side effects. It couldn't be a cat. Hasn't been a cat since the war. You are going to love this one. It couldn't be a baby. Don't be silly. No one's had a baby in 15 years. Oh yeah, gaslighting wins again. Continuing the mission, she comes across Arthur, where Acts 1 and 2 directly overlap. The dialogue is a bit changed here, which like, okay, but the way it was done is, man, it's just bad, dude. The conversation doesn't flow at all. Oh, you have little fucking faith. I'm not gonna turn you in. Whatever possesses you to go off your joy? <sighs> Percy. Oh, God. I saw a picture of him. I promised I'd look after him in Germany. I have to go and find him. Oh, you have little faith. I'd never turn you in. You wouldn't believe what I've got myself into. I saw Percy. A picture of him. And I remembered the train. Oh, shit. Also, Arthur lives in the Garden District now. Uh, I've been living in the Garden the District. The Garden District? 
of the scraps of our former civilization. Oh my God. What? <laughs> Why? In Act 1, he was always on the move, not really staying in one spot because he had to escape and find Percy. Now, he still has to escape and find Percy, so why the f*** did he just set up shop in the Garden District? Also, the conversation's pacing is really weird in Act 2. In Act 1, the tension kept building and building until Arthur just blew Sally off, while in Act 1, the tension starts building. Yeah, well, I've only been wondering for the past 14 We're years. 16! How could you? Then Arthur gets sentimental. You know how we used to sit on the swings by the Crash V1? These days I spend a lot of time there, remembering. Then he just storms off like a man-child. I've missed you for 14 years. I think I can escape Wellington Wells without uh, your help. And I definitely don't want any favors from your latest friend. Arthur! What? All of the changes here are stupid. F*** this scene, it makes me so mad. Sally finishes getting the replacement ingredients and gives the joy to the constables. Reflecting on how difficult of a time this batch was to make, she makes the decision to leave Wellington Wells. Going back home, Gwen has measles now. Okay. It takes measles one to two weeks to start showing, according to a quick Google search, but Gwen just gets it in the course of giving the constables the joy. It's cured with cod liver oil, so Sally goes to Arthur in the Garden District to ask for it. This change bit of dialogue also sucks. In Act 1, it was Sally who asked Arthur if he could get the cod liver oil. Could you do something for me? Here, though, Arthur literally asks if there's anything he can do in return, and gets pissed when the answer is yes. Did you really come here just to offer me a letter of transit? Or did you want something? I thought we could help each other. All right. What do you want? Look, if it's too much to ask... I suppose it would be too much to expect. Don't worry, Arthur. I will ask my friend the General for a rotten scrap of paper just for old time's sake. That's the only bit really changed here, but still. The worst part of this scene, though, is Arthur's clothes. Why is he wearing good clothes in the Garden District? It's made very clear that good clothes in the Garden District is a one-way ticket to getting the sh** kicked out of you. It feels really lazy, like the devs didn't want to bother making a model of Arthur in tattered clothes, especially since there's a model of Arthur's torn up suit in the game. All you'd have to do is copy and paste Arthur's head onto this body and you'd be good. And if it wasn't laziness, it's a complete lack of attention to detail, which is worse. Obviously, this scene wasn't as bad as the other one, but dude. Sally goes to the general to get Arthur's letter of transit, where she learns that he's moved his boat down to the water. Miss Boyle! I won't be happy to see you. He's trying to fix the boat again. The one in the warehouse? You mean the one in the boathouse, as is, Mom? They've moved the boat to the water. He comes back to his office and gives her the letter of transit. And something more. Any friend of yours? It's been too long, anyway. Oddest thing, last time I was there, I could swear I heard something that sounded like a cat. But I haven't seen a cat since the war. Have you? Fortunately, I wrote myself a note. Sally's got a... baby. What do you suppose that means? Do you remember the children born after the war? We got some of them out, but they made everyone so unhappy. Can, can you get us out? I might be able to get her out, if I'm very clever, but no. I can't spare you. What do you think would happen if our beloved Bobbies ran out of Blackberry Joy? I have a safe house. Bring her there. I'm not sending her away. Why not? It's traditional, a single girl in trouble, not equipped to take care of her baby. I'd have thought you'd be grateful. If you couldn't tell, the general, not a very good guy. You failed! He only sees Sally as a tool, with her only use being to keep the constables happy with the Blackberry and himself happy with the... Uh, you know. Sally goes down to check out the boat where the man working on it says the motor is rusted shut. Sally finds a boat manual and commissions a scientist called Dr. Faraday to make a new motor, and now all she needs is the general's key. Before getting the key though, she goes to Arthur to see if he's got the cod liver oil. This scene plays out exactly the same, with Arthur offering to take Sally with him, and then revoking his offer. But then Sally drops this bombshell. It's going crazy out there. We have to go now. Wait, wait. 
I have to go back to my place first. Why? And we sort of have to wait till dawn. Oh, God, no. There's something I have to tell you. No, that, that, that's crazy. I, I can't. Oh, you shouldn't have asked for that ridiculous cod liver oil. I've got a baby. <sighs> it's just self-preservation, Sally. No hard feelings. I don't think Arthur would just brush that off. Nobody would. Sally's baby is probably the only baby born in the last 15 years or so. This is my main problem with Act 2. It does build Arthur's character up more, extremely selfish, yada yada yada, but there is a line. Act 1 did it perfectly. Arthur was angered by Sally's audacity to tell him that one of the people she's sleeping with could help him, annoyed when he had to do something in return for her help, and he left her when she couldn't leave with him in that very moment. To us sane people, it seems a little bit childish. Of course you should help someone who's helping you, tit for tat and all that, but people like that do exist. In Act 2, that line is crossed hard, like way too far. It's almost cartoonish how Arthur acts. He leaves not because Sally said the general could help him, but because he's made it this far without her in his life so he can make this grand escape all alone too. That reasoning makes no sense. At least in Act 1, he realized that he did need help, but it was just too late when he did. He got mad when he had to do something for her in return for her help, just like in Act 1, but here he asked her if he could do anything in return, so his frustration makes no sense. And then Arthur left Sally alone in Wellington Wells with a baby. That's my biggest gripe with this act. In Act 1, he had no idea why she had to wait, but now he does. And with such a valid reason, even someone as thick-skulled as Arthur would probably understand and wait it out. Act 2 had always been my least favorite of the acts, and this is one of the major reasons why. Arthur doesn't act like a selfish person, but like a caricature of a selfish person. Too over the top to be considered realistic, which is what I liked so much about the first act. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah. Uh, Sally goes for the general's boat key, the last hurdle standing between her and freedom. Fuck in a bucket. No, ah, uh, no, no. Uh. He literally kidnaps her and tries to hold her hostage in his safe house. He reveals a room full of food and first aid, really showing how terrible the guy is if the kidnapping and attempted wasn't enough. Wellington Wells is starving, but he's just stockpiling food. Sally escapes with his key and goes to get Gwen, taking her down to the boat where they ride out of Wellington Wells. They won't anymore, will they? Make as much noise as you like. Maybe I'm not such a rubbish mum after all. You'll never know how alone someone can be. You have me. I'll have you. You'd never guess I'm happy, would you? We're gonna have such adventures. We'll be the two musketeers. Sally, just like Arthur, takes off her happy mask once she realizes she's out. However, unlike Arthur who kept his in his arms, Sally tosses hers into the water. Arthur did have some sort of good memories to hold on to from Wellington Wells. He had his family and friends, whereas Sally had no good memories. At every turn she was belittled. The general. You don't know what it's like to be alone, do you? <laughs> A girl like you never is. <laughs> For luck. Hi. Come crawling back, have you? Please don't hate me, Anton. Oh, no? I teach you everything I know. You steal my notes. You are my notes, Doctor. You steal my business, and you have the nerve to come back here. You locked me out in the rain to teach me a lesson. Even the one person she could trust, Arthur, did nothing but berate her. Not to mention her family was killed, so it makes sense that she'd never want to look back at Wellington Wells if she didn't have to. After that little act of defiance against the town that had essentially spit on and tormented her for her entire life, she rides off with Gwen onto greener pastures.
Act 3 follows Ollie, whose story starts after he robbed the Victory Memorial Camp. I mentioned this earlier, but Ollie hallucinates his dead daughter Margaret throughout the story. Arthur comes in and tells him about the tanks being fake. In Act 1, they were both pretty much just monologuing, and we got to see Arthur's point of view. Now in Act 3, we get to see what Ollie was talking about. The tanks are hollow, Ollie. What's that? The tanks, they're made of papier-mâché. Like we made at school. We could have fought them. If they didn't really have tanks. Did... Did you know they were fake? Of course not. I wouldn't have had to lie my way off that train. I would have told the lads. But... Would have risen up. But, Ollie... Oh, God. You were the general secretary. I did. You must have known. You don't forget a thing like that. I lied my way off that train. If we'd have known, we'd have risen up. We'd have had to. I promise Percy I'd keep him safe. We'd, we'd have saved time. you. And everyone else's kids. He goes to the general to assure himself and Margaret that he couldn't have known about the tanks. The tanks were fake! The German tanks in the camp, paper mashing! Don't take that tone with me, Sergeant. I'll call the lads. Before the train, tell him. In 1946, before they took the children. I know when they took the children, I. We could have risen up. We could have saved them. I could have saved my daughter. Really? <laughs> would the good townsfolk of Wellington Wells have followed me into the machine guns? Or would they all have hidden in their basements? But after the war, you can't keep a secret like that, sir. Ollie, the safest secret in the world is a secret no one wants to hear. Why didn't you tell me? Oh, Ollie, don't you recall? You used to have such a good memory. You typed all my correspondence. When they requisitioned the newspaper and the glue, they needed quite a lot. They have to know the truth, sir. We have to tell them. The truth has too terrible a cost. Isn't that the decision we all made? Anyway, I'm out here in the Victory Memorial Camp. You don't think I'm the one who decides these things, do you? Who's minding the bloody store, then? The Executive Committee in City Hall. Why don't you drop by for a chat? I'm sure they'd happily listen to the ravings of a mad Scotsman from the Garden District. They'd listen to you, sir. <laughs> they'd tear me apart like starved jackals, and then they'd pop a joy. Alas, Miss Bing. You will not. She'll help me. I'm calling the lads. Leaving the camp, we learn that Ollie absolutely abhors Uncle Jack. Do you remember my meat pounder? That I lent you two years ago. And you lost it smashing some televisions. That's quite an obsession of yours, isn't it? I can't stand Uncle Jack's stupid face. Damn collaborator. Traitor. Oh yeah, remember him? Uh, to refresh, he's the television and radio star of Wellington Wells. Everybody loves him, all except for Ollie, of course. He actually plays a huge role in this story, so keep his lovely face in mind. Ollie now wants to spread the news to all of Wellington Wells. He knows that nobody would listen to him, a drunk Scotsman from the Garden District of all places, so he goes to the house of Victoria Bing, Arthur's former boss and the daughter of the general. Inside, he tries to knock some sense into her, and it goes about as well as you'd expect. Ollie, I didn't ask you here, did I? If you take enough joy, sometimes one forgets the silliest things. People in town are getting a tad bit skinny. I think they're starving to death. And they're painting the streets in fucking rainbows. Have you not noticed? We have to tell people. They need to know the truth. No, Ollie. People do not need to know the truth. Truth is the enemy of happiness. Isn't that the decision we all made? Oh, but you know the truth, don't you? There's not a thing I can tell you that you don't already know, is there? No, it's better not to know. I'm truly sorry about this, Miss Bing. Now tied up, Ollie is forcing Victoria off of her joy so that she can listen to what he's saying. You can see how even just a few minutes with how joy completely destroys her. Why the fuck are you doing this? You evil downer bastard! I am gonna kill you! I am going to kill you! 
After a bit more time, she starts remembering. I brought some food. I made them sing, Ollie, so they wouldn't be afraid. But then they had to get on the train. Do you remember how they screamed? Aye, I remember. All except my daughter. Your daughter? Aye, Margaret. Because she was dead. <gasps> She's still very resistant in helping Ollie, but after a bit more time, she seems to come to her senses. The children won't stop screaming. You have to talk to them. Then they settle down for a bit. Are you mad? <laughs> Aye. We could have saved them, you know. The tanks were made of papier mache. Little Artie Hastings tore a hole in one of them. What could that possibly matter now? I suppose it doesn't. Except that's just the first lie. Then comes the victory that wasn't, and then the happy pills, and the Simon Says, because the kids are all gone. You can paint loaves of bread on the shop windows all you like, but if people don't wake up, we're all going to starve to death. We go to City Hall, back entrance. There's a private elevator. The code is 0126. The date of the victory. I'll write you a letter of transit. It won't be enough. People won't face facts. Not until we take their joy. That's what we have to do, Ollie. And when we do that, they'll murder each other in the street. Let's go see the executive committee. Obviously, it was just a trick to get away from Ollie. He steals a letter of transit from her house and goes to the bridge to the parade. The bridge is closed, so he has to go through the modeling tunnels which provide power from the parade district to the village. There's a secret entrance that leads into the parade under the Uncle Jack fan club. Ooh boy. Needless to say, Ollie and the Uncle Jack fan club hate each other. There's a big float in the fan club which he can use to escape after he spread the news. Grabbing the float and going through the secret tunnel, we're finally in the parade. Ollie steals a hydrogen tank from the Department of Scientific Research to fill up the float, and then goes to the executive committee to try and get them to tell the citizens of Wellington Wells the truth about the tanks and everything else. However, upon entering, we can see that the room is a complete mess, and actually reaching the executive committee, they're just three random people. It's telling that the devs didn't give these people unique models like the ones who actually have power like the General, Dr. Verloc, or Victoria. Wellington Wells is on the brink of falling apart because the people in charge of everything are stoned out of their minds on joy. Ollie tells them about the tanks and all, and it just goes in one ear and right out the other. Who's in charge here? You're in luck. It's me today. We rotate the dread responsibility. Do I know you? So, there's only one of you who doesn't take joy on a day? <laughs> I might have had a little. The tanks in the military camp. Did you know they made a papier-mâché? Oh, that's terrible. Would you like a joy? Have you been getting out into the village lately? People are getting a bit slim. And these charts, are we running out of food? Oh, no, don't look at the charts. They're horrible. Here, let me get you another joy. We've got our own booth. Now at a loss for what to do, Ollie decides that there's only one man who can get the message across. Uncle Jack. He enters his studio, but it's all smashed up, and Jack is nowhere to be seen. In one of the rooms, you can see how the shows that play throughout the village are simply reruns. They can get away with this because everybody's forgetting everything anyway. Why try and make new shows? On a table sits Jack's last show. Playing it, Ollie learns something horrid. Hmm. I'm sure I had it right here. Uh, you know, there are times you can actually take a little too much joy and, um, well, then you can't remember where anything is, can you? Ah, yes. Here it is. Um, Mrs. Florence Gilbert of Brougham Hayes is holding an exhibition of her hand-knit dolls. Oh, she likes to make dolls from all over the world. All knitted in wool. It's his last Two show. How'd you ken that? The, the camera's dolls. smashed. They couldn't have shot another. Do you know who'd have liked that? Margaret. Eh? Why is he talking about you? Who's Margaret? Because hmm? I love dolls. <laughs> what am I talking about? Who cares about the past? Well, listen. Do drop by to see these fabulous dolls at Mrs. Florence Gilbert's. Poor thing. Poor thing? She loved dolls, you know. She had dozens of them, from all over. I can assure you that there's absolutely no truth to the silly rumor that the food is running out. How does he know about your dolls? However, it is true that there's a brand new flavor of joy. Jeez. 
You think a child of your daughter would be over dolls? His daughter? Yes, Ollie. But she'd make these darling little costumes. I knew it was wrong. I mean... She was even excited about going to Germany. It was me. I couldn't imagine living without her, so... So I hid her. Someone tipped them off. And she ran. No, that's not right. It was Jack what turned you in and I what tried to save you. No, Ollie. You turned me in. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. But you were my daughter. Jack Worthing. Margaret I mean it. Worthing. You're Ollie Starkey. No, oh, I couldn't have. I could never have betrayed you. You're my... Neighbour. I was your neighbour. How could I? How could I do a thing like that to a little girl? Dear God. Dear God, I'm sorry, Margaret. I never meant to hurt you. It's a bit late for an apology. What, what can I do? Tell me. Do you hear me? We've come to the end of our time. The food's run out. We're all going to starve to death. You have to stop taking your joy. Take it from Jack Worthy. That's me. People have to know. That Jack's your father? Stop. That Jack's gone. That the food's run out. Oh. Have to stop. That they have to stop. stop taking the joy. Stop it! You have to broadcast the tape. Right, right, I could do that. But you won't, will you? Ollie's disdain for Jack was so strong that he tipped off the Germans. Just because he hated Jack, he got a little girl killed, and the only way to cope was to go to Sally Boyle, who gave him enough drugs to nearly wipe his memory. Hey. How did I get here? Did you go and see Sally Boyle? I can't have. She, she's in the village. Or she came to you. It doesn't matter. She comes by. What, why does she come by? Do we trade? What did you buy from her? Oh, my memory's more than usually fuzzy. Did you take something she gave you? I was... I was sad, wasn't I? I and, and ashamed. The killing of Margaret Worthing was so significant, though, that her memory never left Ollie, and he misremembered her as his own daughter. Ollie speaks a lot about the incident in a note titled, God Help Me. We were at the darts at the King's Head, Tommy and Harry and I. We'd had a couple of pints, nothing too serious, not enough for excuses later, not enough to miss the dartboard. I don't know how many sheets to the wind was Jack, but I could hear him crystal clear. An actor knows how to pitch his voice so it reaches the back of the hall, and yet he's not yelling. And there he was, at the bar, accusing us regular army lads of bending over for the Jerry's. Not that Jack had ever been to battle except to Angie Court and his imagination. When he played Westmoreland in Henry V, he was just home guard like half the town. The girls had stitched uniforms together and sent the boys into the fields with some Lee Enfield from 1916. The general took one look at those lads and knew there was going to be a slaughter. He lied about a lot of things, but that bit was true. There was no fighting the Jerry's in 1943. But this, this is 1947 and now he's saying we should have fought harder. We all should have fought harder. If only the army hadn't surrendered like a bunch of Frenchmen. Why aren't we fighting back? Why aren't we strangling the Jerry's in the alleyways? Why aren't we sabotaging their cars instead of running scrap drives for them? And I say, well, there's 43 tanks on that hill is why. And he calls me a coward. Oh yes, thank God for those tanks, he says. His gang are trying to shut him up because Tommy and Harry and I have dropped the darts and are coming over with mayhem in our eyes. But he keeps at it. If not for those precious tanks, you bastards would have to do something. And the worst of it is, is that I know what no one else in the room knows, or wants to. That the tanks are newspaper and glue. And if Jack knew, he would have had the sense not to say it. But soon we're getting into it, and the Jerry's have to send in a squad of MPs to pull me off them. Of course, they're a little nicer to me than to Jack and his gang, because I work for them, don't I? And Jack sees it, and he just smiles at me, shaking his head. And all I could think of was, you don't get to smirk at me, you actor. You're hiding your daughter, and we're all keeping your secret, and you're superior. So I tell the Germans where to find her. I knew I should have kept my mouth zipped, but once I start talking, I can't stop. I never thought they'd shoot her. I never thought she was in any danger at all, but I knew it hurt him more than anything sending her off. And I knew he was right and I was wrong. I had to wipe that smirk off his face or I couldn't stand myself. May God have mercy on my soul.
I absolutely love this scene. It is my favorite in the entire game. Seeing Jack, always all smiles and sunshine crashing down to Earth, it just does something to me. You may or may not have noticed, but I have a type. A majority of media portrays their protagonists as stoic men, surviving the unsurvivable, unwavering in the face of certain death. We get so used to these archetypes that when a character strays away from it, it's super captivating. That is something we happy few nails on the head. The characters react like humans. It makes them relatable, because we know we'd act in the same way. If you inadvertently killed a little kid, you would be in shambles, just like Ollie. Like, could you imagine if he just didn't react, or reacted like it didn't even matter? No, Ollie. You turned me in. Don't care. Still don't care. I don't care. Ollie broadcasts the tape and sets up the float. On the roof, he has his final moments with Margaret. What do we do now? We say goodbye. To who? I'm not really your daughter. I know that. And I'm not really here. But... I'm a lie, too. We've been together so many years. You don't think having an invisible friend is a wee bit babyish for a man who's been to war? We can hide in the train station till it all blows over. Now that you've put all that on the telly, I think it's time you put away childish things. You're right. You're always right. Goodbye, Margaret. I really like that throughout her final message to Ollie, she loses her English accent, slowly fading into Scottish, showing Ollie coming to terms with the fact that he needs to leave her behind. He delivers a speech to the citizens of Wellington Wells, then pisses everywhere in defiance. After that, we get the epilogue. You all right, sir? I'd forgotten just how heinous a person I am. Well, the truth is not for everyone, sir. You see, some people find they are stronger than they ever supposed. Some people can let go of the confabulations that have comforted them. Some make choices that surprise even themselves. The run out! Sure you don't wish to forget and go back. I was happy before, wasn't I? I love this scene so much. Seeing the citizens dropping their masks, again, it's that subversion of what we know of the characters. These people were always happy and chipper, and now with reality weighing on them, they come crashing down. The people that tormented you throughout the game for trying to bring yourself back to reality suddenly joining you at the bottom and experiencing what you had to experience is just great. The constable gives us a choice, the exact same choice from the beginning of the game. Do you take the oblivion pill, forgetting everything and going back to your happy life in the village, or continue remembering, living with the knowledge that you're a horrid person but you can live a normal life? Choosing to forget, Arthur goes back to the village, playing on a toy scooter like nothing happened. All the people you killed, the lives you destroyed, none of it matters. Everything that you did was for nothing. Arthur is happier in this ending, but what does it matter if it's all artificial? Choosing to remember, Arthur crosses onto the mainland, where for the first time in around 20 years, he sees a kid. He defaults to his usual greeting of, Lovely. Day for it. Despite how bad the weather is, the kid tells him that it's a shitty day, and Arthur is happy because for the first time since Joy's invention, he's able to tell the truth, to be himself without hiding behind a mask. And the game ends. I was talking to a friend about this game, and I told him about this ending. He told me it sounded sort of lackluster. I was thinking about that conversation as I was writing this script, and he's right. This game has no huge final cutscene where it's all high octane and exciting, but it's not supposed to be. Wellington Wells is this oddball city where everyone is doped up on happy pills and everything is going to hell. The entire point is to escape the insanity and go to a land of normalcy. It's strange because a lot of stories have the protagonist living normally before seeking out adventure, and we have a few flips that script by having strange people seek normality. The ending probably feels lackluster to us, the player, because we go from this insane setting with rainbow streets and happy masks to a place that's familiar with ordinary things happening. To Arthur though, the rainbow streets and happy masks are normal, and our version of normal is strange, almost alien to him. You can really appreciate this ending a lot more if you look at it through Arthur's eyes. All of this game's endings are amazing. Arthur's, Sally's, and Ollie's, they're all just brilliant writing. But there is an odd one out. 
Sally's. Her ending is almost shockingly happy. We Happy Few's whole shtick is playing as moderately terrible people trying to escape from a lifetime of tearful denial, yet nothing in Sally's story portrays her as terrible at all. The one thing that could portray Sally in a negative light is that she, well, fornicated with Arthur's dad. This is a bad thing, sure, but in Sally's mind she had no choice. He took her into his home when her mother died, and who knows, if she didn't, he might have kicked her out. We don't know very much about Arthur's dad or what kind of person he was, so it's entirely plausible. She touches on this a bit more in a note titled Arthur. I ran into Arthur on the street. He's exactly the same, I guess, because he always was a little formal, with those big black glasses and keeping his jacket on after school even on the hot days. Only now, he's grown into himself and he looks amazing. I can't remember what I said. I insulted him apparently. It's always so easy. I thought he chopped my head off. What was I supposed to tell his dad? No, you're practically my stepfather? That would have gone over Brillo. Arthur and Ollie's stories were about learning the truth of how horrible they'd been, coming to terms with things, reconciling with themselves, and moving on. Sally's story was about learning the truth of how she wasn't as horrible as people made her think, coming to realize how she was the best mother that she could be, and moving on. Her ending is the weakest, not really having any twist like Arthur's or Ollie's, but I appreciate it for what it is. It's a neat little shakeup from the terrible protagonist of the other acts. Arthur is easily the worst character, and I don't mean that he's poorly written, I mean that he's the worst person of the three. He has nearly no redeemable traits. He's the only character who never really grew as a human being, probably because of his consistent joy use blocking any growth he could have achieved. Ollie's motivation throughout his story was to bring the truth to light to the citizens of the island, to get them out of their delusion and ultimately save them from their inevitable fate of starving to death. Sally's motivation was to make a safe, happy, healthy life for her baby, and when she realized it was completely impossible, her goal immediately changed to escaping for her baby sake. Arthur's motivation was to escape for his own sake. He's always been selfish. It's ironic. Arthur used Percy as a motivator to escape Wellington Wells, and he knew from the start that it would never be possible to find him, exactly how he used Percy to avoid going to Germany where he knew from the start he'd never go with him. In a twisted way, Percy is still a tool for Arthur to use to his advantage. He never changed in the nearly 20 years that passed since he abandoned his brother. The motivation for every character relies on someone else, all except for Arthur. Ollie did it for the people, Sally did it for her baby, and Arthur did it for himself. After beating the game, you can look into the extras menu to see all the memories and Uncle Jack shows you collected throughout your adventure. I actually really like the Uncle Jack shows, especially the segment called I Hear You where the citizens of Wellington Wells send him letters. There are actually some neat little facts that you can find by watching these, like that joy causes cat grass syndrome where you believe that an identical duplicate has replaced someone that you know. Dear Jack, there's a stranger in my house who looks just like my wife. <laughs> and she says she's my wife too. What has been done with my real wife and who did this to me? Your help is much appreciated in this matter. There are also arcade modes, survival and sandbox, but my favorite is the night watch, where you play as a constable and beat the shit out of downers. You have to manage your money between buying weapons and Blackberry Joy. Also in this mode, we can see a bit of how Blackberry affects the user, with the constable believing he's only subduing the downers when he's really just killing them. We Happy Few's story is truly phenomenal. I fell in love with it the second I played it. The characters are all well written and memorable, the reveals and twists were brilliantly executed, so why is it such a chore to play? Why is it that sometimes I had to force myself to boot the game up again? We Happy Few focuses on story more than actual gameplay, and that is blatantly obvious. The story is just beautiful, really no other word to describe it, but the gameplay is just plain boring. I can't remember a single moment of actual gameplay, all I can remember about the game is the cutscenes because there's nothing to the gameplay. We Happy Few is a procedurally generated open world. This allows for more replayability, with encounters happening in different places. Wellington Wells is a huge place, like just massive. So when you have this giant open world with encounters that spawn in it in random places, there could be a huge space that you need to travel to go from A to B. And most of this game consists of cutscene, move from A to B, cutscene, move from B to C, cutscene over and over. There's not much there in terms of actual gameplay, and it's not just the main story. There are side missions that you can find scattered throughout the world, but again, those just consist of the same cutscene A to B cutscene formula. It's just boring and tiresome. There is a fast travel system through the hatches connected by rail tunnels under the city, and it helps a lot, but the gameplay just goes from run from A to B to run from the hatch to point B. Put it simply, this game is a running simulator. Literally like 90% of the game is just holding sprint and forward.
And I don't mean to say that the world isn't memorable, because it most certainly is. This game is gorgeous. All of the different types of environments and everything. I just mean that actually sitting down and playing the game, you never really think, oh, that was fun to do, because you're literally just running. The running simulator critique stems mainly from the fact that We Happy Few has a linear story in an open world. For example, in Act 1 you can never meet Sally before meeting Ollie. You can't enter Hayworth Labs until you meet Sally who asks you to go there. When you have a huge world with very specific points where encounters spawn, and those points can be anywhere on any given playthrough, and those points could be hundreds of miles apart, and there's no movement mechanics other than running and jumping, it's really painful to play. This game also includes survival elements like hunger and thirst, but these aren't necessary at all. What the hell? Oh my god! You can go the entire game without eating, drinking, or sleeping and be completely fine. Not eating and drinking gives you small debuffs, and once you eat or drink, you get small buffs. You won't starve or dehydrate to death, it's just mildly inconvenient. I wish there was at least an option to make these necessary to add a little bit of substance to the game for the people that want it. I also think Joy could have been implemented better. Joy is supposed to make people see things as nicer versions of themselves, like how in the beginning the dead rat was a pinata. That never happens again for the rest of the game. Why? That's like one of the coolest aspects of Joy and it never happens outside of one section. I get that it would be a pain, if not impossible, to code something like that for every single part of the game, but why not add some missions where that's the core idea? There's a really cool piece of promotional material for the game, a music video for the song La La La. It features the band singing the song as normal when suddenly the bassist Joy starts wearing off. The music distorts until we hear what's actually happening, just random humming. We can see that the bass was just a potted plant, the drums were just hot dogs slapping against a plate of mystery goop, and the keyboard was just an old typewriter. Like, that's so cool, why would you not implement that? Instead, what we get in game is just a filter wash. It just makes everything prettier. Once the joy meter runs out, fuck, you enter withdrawal. It makes the joy taker suspicious of you because you look sad. That's it. A constable towards the beginning of Act 1 tells you that, Look, sir. Sure. You can fix that door, but them wastrels still ain't gonna take that joy. It makes them see eyes everywhere. Why bring this up at all if you weren't gonna implement it? Maybe they wanted to, but couldn't get it to work? I don't know, it would have made withdrawal so much more interesting, but it just ends up with you hiding until it ends. Also in the launch trailer, Arthur pretends to pop a joy, but spits it out once the lady is out of sight. I think it would have been cool if they had a feature where you could, like, take a fake joy pill or something. It could take suspicion off of you and have none of the effects of joy. It would probably be super rare or expensive, since something like that would be really illegal, so you'd really have to think about when to use it. One last thing with Joy, there was a piece of promotional material for the game which was a commercial for Joy. At the end it had a link which took you to this page, which just takes you back to the game's website. When I first saw this, I thought it was like a piece of merchandise. <laughs> like, it would be so cool to have a bottle of Joy, even if it was empty. Hell, I would have bought it. I mean, I don't know the legality of selling fake pill bottles, but it would have been really cool. There is some cool merchandise for this game too. The We Have a Few Time Capsule has a replica constable mask, stickers, posters, a cool little lamp, and a vinyl record of the soundtrack. I really, really want this. The enemies also feel a bit samey. There are only like four types of enemies. The plague victims, the normal people, the constables, and the doctors. The only ones that are different are the plague victims, who have the chance of giving you the plague when they hit you. When the doctors are introduced, they say, Doctors are here to help you. If you've forgotten your joy, doctors will smell it right away, and they'll give you a quick injection to make your day a lovely one. I actually would have preferred if they tried to fill you with joy. It would have been a unique obstacle instead of another guy trying to kill you. Also, combat is pretty boring. There are three main actions, attacking, blocking, and shoving. Shoving an enemy will stagger them for a moment, doing so twice will knock them over, making them extremely vulnerable to attacks. Attacking and blocking do exactly what you think they do. Fighting people usually boils down to clicking on them until they die. Sometimes you'll have to block, or sometimes they'll block you, but it's really just quite basic. Almost all encounters play out exactly the same. When you get into a fight with multiple people though, it's probably best to flee the scene and hide in a garbage bin or something. Some enemies are stronger than others, as indicated by bars around the aggression indicator thing. Zero means they're pretty easy, literally a stray cough would knock them over, all the way to three, meaning they're tough, usually equipped with heavy hitting weapons. Weapons also add some variation. There's two main aspects to them, strength and speed. For example, a stick will swing pretty quick, but isn't very significant damage-wise, while a shovel will have a significantly slower swing speed, but hit much harder. Weapons can also have other effects like bleed on hit or electrocution, but honestly none of that really matters because going with the weapon that deals the highest damage always works out. 
Enemies will never do anything surprising. They'll just stand there and let you hit them, or block when you try to hit them. You fight one, you've fought them all, really. In Act 2, it said that Sally isn't great at hand-to-hand -hand combat and that she relies on her chemicals. I have literally countless playthroughs under my belt, and never once have I used a single chemical. The crafting recipes for the chemicals that are offered right from the start are so outlandish, like you would have to go out of your way to look for them. I'm sure if you do some side quests you could get them no problem, but just running through the story I've never been able to craft them. Also, Sally's baby is a primary aspect of her gameplay. If you neglect it, you get these things called totems of parental neglect. I'm a collector myself. Neglect. They take up inventory space, and the only way to get rid of them is to go back home and take care of her. It's not too bad, but it can be a bit irritating to have to drop yeah. everything just to feed your stupid kid. And then in Act 3, Ollie has his own unique aspect of gameplay diabetes. It's not too big of an issue due to how short Ollie's story is, but basically you can't let it get too low or it'll start insulting people, and you can't let it get too high or it'll start dying. Ollie also can't tolerate joy, throwing up anytime he takes it. Okay, last thing. So I recorded all the gameplay on my PC, but I like this game so much I bought a copy for PS4. The performance is terrible. Consistent low frames, constant frame drops, super long loading times, it's super unoptimized and just emphasizes how bad the gameplay is. Like you'll get to play for a bit and then hit a loading zone and just get sad knowing you'll wait 5 minutes just to keep running in a straight line once you get back. Also this is the only game I've ever played on my PS4 that crashes, so. To sum up my thoughts so far, super cool and unique story. I adore the characters and all that. The endings were masterful. Seeing how distraught the characters are over their actions is truly astounding. The actors really sell the show. The gameplay is just plain boring though, which drags down the experience a ton. There's a ton of unused or underutilized concepts and mechanics, and the game really would have benefited from just a bit more tweaking with some of them. I believe that the gameplay mainly suffers from the open, procedurally generated world. It does allow for some replayability, but who would want to replay the game when you're just running in a straight line pretty much all the time? And not to mention that this game is long, like 20 and a half hours for the main story and 66 and a half hours for 100% completion according to HowLongToBeat.com. So how would we Happy Few have fared if it were shorter and more linear, where the gameplay gimmicks were the forefront of the campaign? campaign with the story still being as clever and unique as ever? Well, my friends, our answer lies in the three DLCs released for the game. The maps of the DLCs are set, they're the same on every playthrough, so you don't need to worry about having to run for 15 minutes between objectives. This eliminates the linear story in an open world critique by having a linear story in a linear world, and you can really feel it in the DLCs as they each have their own unique mechanics that really shine when they're not bogged down by the open world. I won't talk about the DLCs as I did with the base game, I'll just comb through them. The first DLC was They Came From Below, starring James and Roger, two gay guys who were trying to stave off an alien robot invasion. So, uh, you can probably tell this is really out there, but in a good way. It's really sci-fi-y, which doesn't really fit in with the We Happy Few world, but it is just a one-off, so it's alright. In the DLC, you're equipped with a ray gun, making this the first and only ranged weapon in the game. Throughout the game, you learn that the alien robots can think and feel and love just like people do. Dr. Faraday, James and Roger's boss, has been torturing and dismantling them to make farming supplies so that Wellington Wells doesn't starve. A righteous act on paper, but knowing that these robots are essentially people makes it horrendous. You play as Roger, who believes it's up to him to free the robots from their torment. However, James, his boyfriend, doesn't feel the same way, causing a divide in their relationship. You really have a very great contempt for me, don't you, James? Oh, puppy, I... You think all my theories are bollocks? Not all of them. You can't imagine things different from the way you think they are. What the hell does that mean? 
You think it's safer to be terrified of everything strange, and you think I'm a child for even trying to embrace it. But sometimes there's a bigger price for being a coward. <sighs> Sorry. I didn't mean that. I... Go fuck yourself, Roger. I left everything for you. In the end, they team up to defeat Dr. Faraday and go into a portal to join the robots in their own world. I do love you, James. I do love you, Roger. It's a fun, cute little DLC. The second is Lightbearer, starring, well, Nick Lightbearer. Yeah, baby! He's the lead singer of The Make Believes. He's your typical rock star, you know, drinking, doing drugs, you know, the works. Your main weapon is Nick's guitar, which functions completely differently to any other weapon. You can't block attacks, instead opting to parry them by strumming your guitar at the right time. Then you play some jams into their face until they die. A joy also has a unique function here. Instead of the base game where it was an inherent evil thing that you are meant to avoid, here it's your main source of healing. This DLC story is super unique and runs deeper than how it seems on the surface. Nick is dead. In a side quest in Act 1, Sympathy for the Lightbearer, you can watch Nick electrocute himself to death accidentally. I used to be bottled power man. Oh god, the power cell. I'm not gonna drink it. I learned that lesson. <laughs> This DLC takes place in Purgatory, as represented by the hotel that he's staying at. Throughout the DLC, Nick questions and challenges his morals because he believes that he kills people when he blacks out after doing drugs. At the end, Nick vows to never touch drugs or alcohol again. My drugs made me a monster. Or maybe I really am a monster. No more party favors, ever. Good clear head, Nick. <laughs> clear head. And plays the best song in the game. He pledges to his fans that he'll be a changed man from now on, ascending into the sky, his soul free to move on. The third and best DLC ties directly into the main story. We All Fall Down stars Victoria Bing and takes place immediately after escaping Ollie in Act 3. On her way to find a joy booth, she sees the true state of Wellington Wells. People eating charcoal, the plague ravaging the streets, the corruption of the constabulary with a constable threatening a lady over some food. Did I hear you had a spot of meat to spare then? Mustn't hoard food, Mrs. M. Wouldn't want people thinking you're a down minute and a man chatting with a corpse. What Ollie was trying to get through to her is finally registered in her head. Wellington Wells is on his last leg, and now realizing this, she refuses to take her joy. Um, Miss Ping, there isn't anybody in there. What are we doing? You can utilize a facility. What are we doing here? <laughs> Taking our joy, I hope. Good Lord, Mum, you, um... You might want to take a lot, eh? Wouldn't want to mistake you for a towner, eh? I... I, I can't oh. take my joy. I have to... Sweet Jesus! Keep a clear head. You are! You've got downer! You'd best come with me, Mum. Miss Piggy's a downer! 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 She's a downer! Victoria's combat is amazing. She's equipped with a whip and later an electric dart gun. You can upgrade your weapons by using contraptions scattered throughout the world, and it allows for a much more enjoyable and nuanced combat experience. For example, I got upgrades that let you pick up the electricity from one enemy with your whip and transfer it to another. It's incredibly fun and fluid. You can also use the whip to get to out of reach areas, which feels super fun. It kinda reminds me of a more limited version of Marvel's Spider-Man for the PS4. The DLC has Victoria trying to rid the island of joy entirely. First she destroys the pill allocator which makes the pills stop appearing in joy booths and then moves on to the water supply. Well, Wellington Wells is saved. Let's see how everyone's taking it. <laughs> Pretty well, I'd say. Obviously with such severe consequences, it won't take long for the situation to be fixed. So she goes to Hayworth Labs with dynamite and blows it up, which would stop joy production for good. While this is happening, Ollie is playing Jack's last show and we get to see more of the carnage that comes with ridding the town of joy. More fires, hanged constables, more dead people, happy masks strewn about, and dead doctors. Oh look, it's Miss Bing. Lovely day for it, Miss Bing. We know what you did. I did what had to be done. What gives you the right? What gives you the right? You are all going to starve to death. 
my brother did die. The bobbies hit him a little too hard. You lot told us everything was fine. You told us to pretend it was. We all wanted to pretend. Don't you remember? We're all leaving. There's nothing left here. You can go wherever you like. Just not with us. We get one more view of the city before the credits roll. The gameplay in this DLC was a blast, the combat was phenomenal, and making huge jumps with the whip felt amazing, especially in Harryworth Labs which is much more vertical, making great use of the whip pulls. I can't say anything negative about the gameplay of these DLCs. With how short and linear they are, everything felt like it was utilized well, nothing felt ignored or underused, and it's really refreshing to visit these after playing the base game. I feel like if the main game had this type of gameplay, where it was enjoyable and memorable to actually play and the combat was a bit more engaging, the game could have been top tier greatest of all time material. But what we got was a game that was, to some people, a complete letdown. A game that drew people in with good visuals and story, but no actual substance to speak of gameplay wise. We Happy Few on YouTube is a sea of unfinished playthroughs, not even getting past Act 1 because the gameplay just isn't it. The story is almost unmatched, being super interesting but with nothing there in terms of gameplay it was easy to just deem it not worth it to continue playing. We Happy Few is an experience that you have to fight through but if you can stick it out to the end it is a truly amazing experience that you'll find is hard to forget. <sighs> I guess what I'm trying to say is that We Happy Few is an amazing story weighed down by a bad game. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! This video is very bittersweet for me. We Happy Few has consumed my life for the better half of six years. <laughs> I remember playing it on the lowest settings because my shitty little computer couldldn't handle it all those years ago, trying to find the next part in Jacksepticeye's series, and having so many thoughts about this beautiful game sitting in my head all that time. Now having said all that I've wanted to for so long, I think I'm done with this game. I've explored more than I could ever want to of Wellington Wells, done almost every side quest multiple times, watched every Uncle Jack show, had my fun poking into the characters, finding out all that I can about them and their past, I even platinumed the game on PS4 despite how bad it is on that platform. I've said my piece. I'm done. Thank you so much for watching. Like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't, subscribe if you want to, don't if you don't. I've been Howard, and I'll see you when I see you.